Greetings, gentle listeners. If you enjoy this podcast, you may also like Bros A, a mirthy talk show starring four bros who sip wine and consider questions submitted by you, the audience, about current events, pop culture, and which Muppet you should get tattooed on your back. Subscribe to Bros A wherever you get your podcasts. That's B R O S E. Bros A, the podcast for those who drink rose. What does Space Truckers have to do with Treasure Quest? What say we turn this octopus into a cuttlefish? Does the B in Bezos stand for Boy Am I Hungry? Are you ready for software engineers to ruin your life again? Do you ever feel like a plastic bag filled with water? What do you like to? <laughs> The answers to these questions plus sports, emotional weather, and stayed up, that's tonight on Person in Person. Good evening, wherever you are, whoever you are, and welcome to Person in Person. I'm Gene Person. And I'm Greg Person. No relation. Person in Person is a news show for people who do not like news shows by people who do not like news shows. That's right, Gene. It's just two people going through a mental health crisis live for your entertainment. Yeah. Let's get into tonight's story beats. The world record for thigh watermelon crushing has been smashed by Las Vegas athletic wear entrepreneur Courtney Olson, who crushed three watermelons betwixt her powerful thighs in just 7.62 seconds, obliterating the previous men's and women's records. If anybody needs me, I'll be respectfully watching it on YouTube over and over again. Okay. I'm just saying, Gene, you know, the- I don't want to be a creep. But Courtney is not the only one who is crushing, and she's not the only one who wants to smash. All right. The Girl Scouts are reportedly sitting on a payload of over 15 million boxes of Thin Mint cookies after sharp downturns in sales numbers during the pandemic. They're urging people to buy them online, but if those cookies are otherwise going to waste, I strongly encourage the Girl Scouts to look into my now-submitted blueprints for the town of Cookietopia. NBC is halting production of their new game show, Ultimate Slip and Slide, because a Giardia outbreak on set caused an undisclosed but reportedly very high number of cases of explosive diarrhea. Skeptics and believers alike are calling it the strongest evidence for the existence of God since Jim Caviezel got struck by lightning. (laughs) A Cincinnati, Ohio man crashed his car into a utility pole after a cicada flew into his car and smacked him on his face. The man panicked, jerked to the wheel, and went straight into the pole after the incident. The cicada was quoted as saying, That's enough. I knew it was coming this time and you still got me. Yeah. It's, I, it's always nice to do a callback every now and then. Well, you should always end a comedy set with a callback. We know that. And I'm... Wait. wait no, what? we're not there yet. Slow down, Gene. Okay. Louis Gohmert, widely and justly regarded as the stupidest man in Congress, which puts him high in the running for stupidest worldwide, recently asked a representative of the U.S. Forest Service to alter the orbit of the moon to combat climate change. Fun fact, Gomert's last job was as a federal judge. Oh, Jesus. Uh, I mean, not for nothing, but Gomert's level of stupidity is such that he can't have a regular job. So the only right. the only you know options that are open to him in society are federal judgeships and elected office. Right, right. A commercial lobster diver in Massachusetts claimed this week that he was swallowed whole by a humpback whale, but survived after being spit out 30 seconds later with bruising but no serious injuries. 
The man reportedly worried for his children while he was stuck in the whale, especially his oldest, who was meticulously carved in pine. When, when asked whether his name was Jonah, the man replied, call me Ishmael. All right, enough about the news. Let's get on to main news. Treasure Quest, a PC game released in 1996 by Sirius Publishing, Inc. The game involved navigating 11 rooms of a mansion to decipher a famous quote from a series of puzzles, visual clues, and anagrams. It promised a million dollars to the player who solved it. The development of Treasure Quest was fraught with efforts to keep the solution from being available to employees. It resulted in two teams developing about half the puzzles each, in addition, a large number of typos were included to further keep the solution out of sight. Unfortunately, this method of development prevented the teams from reporting potential errors to the other team, and so several mistakes and errors made their way into the actual game. The company sold a companion book designed to help readers in their quest to find the solution, but it was of negligible use, and some speculate the typos and errors that made their way into the final product were done so intentionally to drive sales of the book. I had this game, and Jesus, was was it hard to even know what was expected of you? It really just felt like a confusing mess. Granted, I was only 18 at the time, but even now I think I'd struggle to assemble anything based on all of the scattered clues. However, one Oregonian did. A school teacher named Paul Wigowski of Woodburn, Oregon submitted the correct solution, but his res response was disqualified by Sirius due to his failure to put the required registration number in the upper right-hand corner of his submitted solution, which apparently was required by the official rules of the game. Shortly after, Sirius announced that the prize had been claimed by someone named P. Dryzen of San Francisco, California. P. Dryzen never appeared in any online chat rooms or forums, never publicly appeared at all, seemingly. When some users noticed that the name P. Dryzen could be an anagram of End Prize, the controversy grew. It's one unique slice of gaming that overlaps treasure hunting from a very specific time period in my personal history, and it's kind of an interesting story. But what does that have to do with Space Truckers? It's a 1996 sci-fi comedy by Stuart Gordon, who is the most underrated director of all time. Stars Dennis Hopper, a uh, young Stephen Dorff, uh, Debbie Mazar, whom I am passionately and permanently in love with. Mm -hmm. And it's got Charles Dance and George Went, uh, both playing very different sorts of villains, but both memorable and delightful. Hmm. Um, like all Stuart Gordon movies, it's cheap and campy, um, but it also shows more creativity, cleverness, and competence than 99% of the big budget movies you've ever seen. And uh, I personally feel, and again, as we've established uh, when talking about literature, it carries over to film, my opinions are facts. <laughs> so whether or not you like Stuart Gordon is actually a, a good indicator of how well you understand what makes a film good. So if you don't like this movie, you just don't actually like movies. Okay, I'm, I'm Googling Stuart Gordon because it's not a name I'm familiar with. You know, I'm not going to throw any shade at you over that because that's the point. He's the most underrated director of all time. Right, but I'm... I'm oh, Reanimator? Okay. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Robot Jocks. Yes. All favorites. All classics. I fucking love this man's work. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Um, you know, there's a... If you're a horror movie fan, a lot of the movies that he've done, he's done have been horror. Mm -hmm. I would say Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is probably his most well-known mainstream work. And, mm -hmm. like, nobody knows that he actually directed it. Robot Jocks was a festering pile of crap, but I love it. Okay, you you just came for Robot Jocks, and now I feel personally attacked. Okay, you can feel because... personally attacked, but the big catchphrase that they said before they go to fight is crash and burn. Crash and burn, Jock buddy. Hell yeah, dog. All right, and... and... Because it's like they're saying break a leg, you know? Okay, what's your opinion on the chainsaw cock? I mean, it rules. Yeah, it kind of does. Everything okay. about that movie rules. Like, yeah, what do you right. want me to say? I'm really hoping that MST3K approaches that movie at some time, because I think it's it's it'd be really a fun one for them to do. Well, that was it was a favorite of mine when I was a kid, um, because... Oh, same here. I, same here. I just, know, I I just loved it. I watched it sometime later and was like, 
wow, <laughs> did I have no taste at all? But I still loved well, it. it. It's well, funny you know, because... I watched it like two months ago and I was like, this movie's amazing. Oh, really? Well, and here's the other cool thing about Robot Jocks. Uh, the screenplay was written by Joe Haldeman, mm -hmm. which um, if you're a, a big time uh, sci-fi fiction nerd, uh, Joe Haldeman's a very big name. Uh, he wrote The Forever War, uh, which is his most famous work. Mm. Um, but he's, you know, written a lot of stuff since then uh, that's also fantastic. Well, okay, and... here's the thing. I thought I thought Crash and Burn was hokey AF. I thought I thought the Chainsaw Cock was. It's kind of. It's kind of awesome in that way that, you know, when you're 13, you think a professional wrestler is awesome. Um. But at the same time, I, I couldn't stop smiling the whole time I watched it. So there's that. Well, here's the thing. Okay, it's a movie about giant robots fighting for the fate of the world. It's not a very grounded film. That's true. That's true. And it, honestly, the message of the movie is one of peace. And except here's the thing. It actually is a grounded movie. Because, you know, in between robot fights... Well, the bulk of the movie, really, mm -hmm. it's it is about character and it's about relationships. Yeah, and it's about Achilles, played by the great Gary Graham, mm -hmm. who uh, you know was also one of the stars of Alien Nation, the best TV show ever made. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's about him overcoming his fear and uh, you know claiming his place in the world and finally realizing that even though you know he's like he's like Athena, the Tubi. He's realizing he's been made for war too, and he doesn't have to be that. We can live. We can, we can both, both live. live. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. I haven't oh, seen that movie, movie in probably ten years, and it's amazing how much of it I remember. Because it's it's a memorable movie. Because yeah. it's a great film. Like it's on Amazon. If you have an Amazon account, you can watch that shit for free. You can watch it right now. I'll wait. Okay, but what do these two things have to do with each other? What does Space Truckers have to do with Treasure Quest? Well, you know what's funny is we haven't even talked about Space Truckers yet because we we went off on Robot Jocks right, for 10 right. minutes. But, um, have you, well, first of all, have you seen Space Truckers? I have never seen Space Truckers. Okay, well, you've got to watch it. It's also available free on Amazon. Basically what it is, is it's a satire of... The, well, it's a it's a future galaxy that's very corporate, and it's kind of, you know how some visions of the future are grimy and others are shiny. Yeah. Well, this one is simultaneously grimy and shiny. Well, it's this already sounds like a really interesting movie, and it's got Debbie Mazar, which means I'm definitely going to watch it. Oh, absolutely. Well, because I know that you also are in love with her, as is, like. Any any person with any sense right. is in love with Debbie Mazar. You can't not be. She is she is an ageless beauty. There is something about her that, literally, from the first time I saw her, which I can't remember when it was. We talked about this, uh, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I just was was smitten with her and remain smitten. Debbie, I know you're listening, and I know you're you're happily married to an Italian chef, and that's great, but. You know, bottom line is he is not going to love you like I will. <laughs> just just throwing that out there. Courtney, do not be jealous. I know you are also listening. There is, you know, our love is big enough for the three of us to share. And and since we're talking about Courtney and Debbie and our love, let's also let's also throw our, our, our fabulous Tim and his wife into the mix because we, we got to let you guys know that we have enough love to go around. And for that yes. matter, Gil, I mean. <laughs> yeah, you are also currently married to another person. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, we're, we're big love kind of guys. We yeah. are, we are the Bill Paxton's in this scenario. Yes. Although, but although maybe we're also a little bit of Chloe Savini and Jean Triplehorn, Jennifer Goodwin, you know, Maybe we're a little bit of the wives because there's so many men up in this mix is all I'm saying. True, true. But to return to the subject of um, space truckers. Oh, yes. Sister hum husband. Now, Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> you are welcome, brother wife. <laughs> um, the, the plot of the movie is Dennis Hopper plays a space trucker and he's got a load. He brings it in 
Uh, the boss, he's an independent trucker. The boss who had contracted him for the load screws him out of his fee. He has to take another load. The load is full of killer robots. Mm. They get captured by pirates. Uh, Charles Dance is the pirate king, <laughs> and he f- fucking slays in this I, movie. I, I, I cannot think of a better actor to play a pirate king. Oh, God. he's Well, he's always brilliant. Right. And he's almost always, you know, the villain because he's so perfect as a villain. And then George Went, huh, is, is the other villain. Yeah, George Went plays the boss of the trucking company who okay. screws uh, okay. who screws the yeah. trucker. If, if ever there was a character actor who could play the boss of a trucking company, it's George Went. Exactly, and he, he nails it. Everybody's performance, and here's the thing. Here's why Stuart Gordon is a great director. You're like, oh, here's this movie about, what, zombies, dead bodies, robots, whatever? The thing is, he's going to get real performances out of his actors. Yeah. They're, you know, every actor in a Stuart Gordon movie is going to give one of the best performances of their lives. Yeah, that's true. The design, the design of this movie is so fun and so smart. Okay. I got, I got two words for you. They'll make sense when you watch the movie and you'll be like, oh, that's great. That's like the best of Terry Gilliam square pigs. Okay. Yes. That is that is the cargo that uh, the trucker is hauling, um, square pigs. What? And, um, uh, so so we've gushed a lot about space truckers now. Yeah, tell me more about this treasure quest. So, unlike this polished vision that was space truckers, treasure quest was this cacophonous puzzle that none of it seemed to make any sense or tie into any other part of it. There were so many problems with it. Um, I remember it crashing all the time. And, and I I guess I'm allegedly there's a chance that, uh, that the, the company that published it gave the prize to themselves. Well, and that's what it sounded like to me. And this is the first time I'm hearing of this story. It sounded like a scam, right? Because they deliberately set this thing up to be as fucked up and insoluble as possible. Right. Somebody solves it and they're like, oh, no, sorry. Right. We forgot I mean, to mention. That's kind of how it plays. And, and, and I'm having a hard try, time tying that to this magnum opus of, of <laughs> Stuart Gordon. Well, the the truck, the trucking boss, uh, the, the guy who owns the square pigs, Mm -hmm. he screws the, uh, the trucker out of his fee for his load. Okay. So there's that. That's we've, we've got something at least. Um, and then, and and interestingly, the PC game was released in 1996 and this movie was made in 1996. Oh shit. Okay. I think I'm seeing what's happening here. And I, I think I see a connection. Uh huh. Uh, what this game so clearly lacks, deliberately, they set it up like this, uh-huh. was a single cohesive vision, right? Right. Like they lit- they made it as fractured as possible so it became totally non functional. Mm-hmm. What they needed, which is something that I feel like later games like AAA titles now will do this, they needed a director. Oh, okay. You know, because the director is what you need to make sure everybody's doing their best work, adhere to a singular vision, you know, keep everybody on track and on schedule, make sure that shit isn't broken. And they needed Stuart Gordon to direct this game. Yeah, okay. Um, You know, this game, I don't know that it needed a director... In, in the sense that Gordon, Stuart Gordon seems like a storyteller. There wasn't really, this game wasn't about story. It was about puzzles. It was about, well, I guess there was a, a little bit of a story. In the, in the game, this, uh, this wealthy man left his fortune to the person who solves his clues. But it really, I mean, that was such a minimal part of the whole experience. Yeah, you know, that's that's like uh, pretty thin. I, you know, thinking about it, that's something that is different about games now versus games then. You didn't need a story, a narrative in, in games of yore because the mechanic was the thing. Like, 
the well, game was was all anybody cared about. If you compare, like, say, Zombies Ate My Neighbors or whatever it was called to The Last of Us, to two games about fighting zombies, one of which tells this incredible cinematic story than, that is better than most novels I have read. Right. Well, and that's the thing is, like, these days, all games are narrative. And right. the better the narrative is, the better the overall game is generally judged to be right because games have have ascended beyond the mechanic and and become an art form they really are a mechanism for telling a story that is its own thing but that still doesn't tie treasure quest and space truckers together i think that 1996 is a strong tie. I'm wondering if the connection between these two items is that we were just feeling a little nostalgic for 1996 this week. That's there's something in the air that that made us both think, you know what? That was a good year. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. That's the connection. 1996. Yeah. And that it. and that works. It's it's what we're going with. It was, it was a year of highs and lows. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was an age of space truckers. It was an age of treasure quest. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to breaking news. The octopus is a thoroughly asocial creature, except for mating, which for an octopus is like trying to buy drugs in a strange city. <laughs> it's dangerous. They don't really want to, but they got to. Right. And other than that, they completely avoid their own kind. Mm -hmm. But even though the octopus has no social instinct at all and a radically different brain than humans, or for that matter, pretty much anything else, uh, they do have serotonin. And so there were some researchers at Johns Hopkins who wondered if it would affect their sociability the same way it does ours. So they bathed the octopuses in a solution of seawater and molly, and they found that it did indeed turn them social. Uh, the octopuses, instead of uh, keeping as far away from each other as possible, which is what they normally do, they got close to each other, they touched tentacles, and then they hugged. Eight-arm hugs, which no one had ever seen before because octopuses don't hug. Right. Now here's the thing. This sounds cool. This sounds fun. This sounds sweet. Whatever. The thing is, octopuses, they've got so many limbs. They have camouflage. Their bodies are so compressible, like an octopus as big as you can fit in a peanut butter jar. It's true, yeah. They're nature's most perfect assassins. And if they discover that they can team up... Oh, shit. It, yeah, if they develop tribes and cultures... We are fucked. Okay? It's going to make our situation in Planet of the Apes look like a spa day. So, I'm, I'm saying now to the world, to these scientists, this is, you know, say it with me. Your scientists were so concerned with whether or not they could, <laughs> they didn't stop to think if they should. Right. I mean, should you do something to make octopuses the greatest threat to mankind? Because don't kid yourself. You might be thinking, oh, if I can teach this octopus about the concept of friendship, maybe he'll want to be my friend. No, he won't. Like, it is impossible to convey how weird and alien and threatening you will seem to an octopus. Mm -hmm. I mean, they'll wage war and exterminate us in self-defense. Considering how we treat them and what we do to the oceans, when they find out about calamari, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, right. You know, a nice uh, little pulpe, some soup. So you're going to fucking, you know, it's in the dark. Okay. In the silence, eight arms coming at you, a blade in each one. That's not to what's, what's going to happen. Not to mention tentacles with, you know, in some cases, venomous suction cups. Right. The blue spotted octopus, the most dangerous octopus, I well, believe, not even, is poisonous. I mean, so so there's there's that, but there's also there's also oct octopuses that have have actual venom in their suction cups that are that are not the blue octopus that that maybe won't kill you, but will sting the hell out of you. Right, and you know, if there's enough of the octopuses, if it's five or six of them in a gang, maybe it will kill you. We don't know that. 
Right. And I mean, interestingly, when you were reading, when you're reading this story, and you mentioned that they have a different brain than than most humans, and no social instinct, and they have serotonin, I was thinking, am I an octopus? You might be an octopus. Actually, count your limbs real quick for me, please. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Oh fuck. <laughs> You're a pentapus. <laughs> I'm a pentapus. <laughs> All right. On my story this week, a new online petition and exercise in the most beautiful kind of creativity, the kind that is a complete waste of time, has started to circulate online. Over 4,800 people have signed the change.org petition as of this time, asking Jeff Bezos, the second richest man in the world, to please buy the Mona Lisa and eat it. Yes. Because what good is wealth if you can't digest a priceless work of art every now and then and potentially rescue the French government in the process? The government has flirted with the idea of selling the famous work by Leonardo da Vinci as a method of fundraising, thinking it could fetch as much as $50 billion, though I suspect that may be optimistic. Given the other story we've covered on da Vinci's work, containing extremely toxic bacteria and fungus, not to mention toxins in the paint itself... This may be perhaps the most dangerous meal ever entertained by a billionaire. You might think I'd be all for it, but I have a suggestion. I think what he should do is buy it and have a dinner party, inviting other billionaires to bid on seats at the table. This is all an exercise in daydreaming, as Bezos obviously isn't going to eat a priceless painting unless compelled to do so. With, you know, say, a gun at his back. Not that I'm advocating for anyone to do such a crazy thing. Wink. In the meantime, we'll just have to settle for the fact that Warren Buffett paid a couple of million to turn Monkey Christ into a Warren Buffet. Allegedly. Okay, I have to know, who is alleging that? Is that is that you, or is that alleged by other people in the world? Yeah, because... it's, it's me. It's me. Okay. okay. Well, I mean, it's still probably true, because you're a journalist, <laughs> and if you lie, you get in trouble, so... <laughs> Right. I'm a journalist. <clears throat> now, here's the thing. I agree with you. I don't think this is really going to happen because Jeff Bezos is going to spot right off that this is just a picture of a person and contains no actual human flesh. Yeah, there's no adrenochrome in there. So why would he want it? <laughs> <An> adrenochrome. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So good. But no, I, I agree that he should do this because I think that if he were to buy and eat the Mona Lisa, that would become the greatest work of art of all time. Right. Right. That it would be a work of, of performance art. Absolutely. Because the, the Mona Lisa, I, I have a problem with the Mona Lisa. I have a bug up my ass about this and I'll tell anybody who will listen and you're listening to my podcast right now. So buckle the fuck up. (laughs) All right. The Mona Lisa is not a particularly good or interesting painting. No, it's not. Okay? It doesn't even approach the best of Da Vinci's work. The only reason it's famous is that it was stolen early in the 20th century mm-hmm. and the crime became a whole deal. But the reason it was stolen is that it was small. Right. Not because it was a great work of art, because it was easy to hide under your coat. Mm-hmm. So... That's the painting that you all have been venerating and fawning over for a hundred years. It's not particularly good or interesting, so spare me any of your bullshit about the Mona Lisa's enigmatic smile. Shut up. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, I hope he eats it. And, you know, I hope that fungus just really goes to town. Yeah. Are you warm? Are you real, old Jeff Bezos? Or just another cold and lonely, lonely work of art? That is lyrics to a song, but I don't know which one. Uh, That that would be Mona Lisa. All right. Oh, of course. It's on to to sports. An Australian entry into our sports segment, sheep counting, involves 10 competitors, all who try to count several hundred sheep as they rush past. The competitor with the most accurate count wins. I tried to watch some YouTube videos of the sport, but I kept falling asleep. (laughs) How these powerhouses of the athletic world manage to stay awake is beyond me. They truly are cut from a different cloth. No doubt, 
a wool cloth. Now, I do want to say something here uh, to you and also to our listeners. When you made the joke about falling asleep watching videos of sheep counting, mm -hmm. I laughed. I want you to know I laughed involuntarily. <laughs> that, that laugh is not an endorsement of that joke. <laughs> I think it's a great joke. Well, I mean, it made me laugh. So what can you say? But I want you to know I am a sophisticated man. <laughs> and I have, <laughs> I have a... <laughs> Uh, a nuanced and and uh, elevated sense of humor and that joke did not work on me i just <laughs> laughed involuntarily it was like a hiccup right right humor hiccup got it okay folks it's time for our emotional weather this week it's rushed blushed and flushed rushed now this is uh, one for eugene uh not eugene but you comma gene mm-hmm uh, Universal Orlando has debuted a new coaster that seems tailor-made ah, for you. The Velocicoaster, coaster, yes, yes. Oh, you heard about that already? That's dope. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you probably have a Google alert for new roller coasters, <laughs> but uh, this one uh, for the for the listeners who don't have a Google alert for coasters, it's a double launch coaster, which means it shoots you off again with fresh momentum in the middle of the roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Uh, one review of the coaster that I read called it thrilling from beginning to end. And the conceit of the roller coaster is that the Velociraptors are chasing you the whole time, which actually sounds pretty fun. And I know it'll be hard for you to, you've got a lot going on in your life right now, Gene. So it'll be hard for you to get out to Orlando to ride this thing, but life finds a way. Well, that, that is very funny. I am definitely not going to Orlando anytime soon. Uh, and I do have one problem with this roller coaster that is less about the coaster and more about the theming around it. Those are not Velociraptors. Every image I've seen is a Deinonychus dinosaur, which is larger okay. than a Velociraptor. Velociraptors are about the size of chickens. And they have feathers. Yes, we know this, but the, here's my here's my fix for that. Here's my head cannon that resolves that issue that, yeah. that we have with Jurassic Park. In the fictional world, oh, so of in, Jurassic the, in Park, the Jurassic Park universe, Deinonychus was called a Velociraptor. Is that is that what right. you're proposing? Or, well, and the thing is, these are these are cloned, genetically modified creatures. Right. So they probably got an original Velociraptor and saw it, and it actually did look like a turkey. And they were like, "Well, this is dumb. Let's make it bigger and like you know, big teeth and claws and stuff." Okay. Okay. I'll so, accept. I'll accept that idea. Okay. My story for Rushed. A piece of Missouri legislation passed in mid-May designated several state holidays and a few of those holidays stripped out by the time it came to a vote. Among the most contentious days was Rush Limbaugh Day. January 12th, the former propagandist's birthday would be declared a holiday every year, celebrated by popping a handful of oxys, smoking a cigar, and committing countless acts of casual racism and misogyny. Ultimately, the holiday didn't make the cut because several reps raised concerns about his history defending those guilty of sexual assault and ridiculing the victims. Yeah, he did that. And a fellow accused abuser saw fit to award him with a Presidential Medal of Freedom. I am, of course, speaking of fellow accused abuser Donald J. Trump, not fellow accused abuser Joseph Biden. If you truly do go to hell for reveling in someone's death, then I guess I'll be seeing Rush Limbaugh eventually. Well, you know, when Rush Limbaugh sits around hell, he really sits around <laughs> hell, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. Now, for Blushed, uh, it was National Rosé Day last Saturday, Ooh. which escaped my notice at the time, or I would have uh, put it on this past show. So I'm a little bit embarrassed about that, so I am also blushed. But I want to give a belated shout out to our buddies at the Brose podcast. Yeah, I love those I'm, guys. I'm sure that they commemorate it. it uh, I haven't listened because I'm about two months behind on all my podcasts because I've I've uh, started to uh, get this. I'm reading books now. Oh, yay. I yeah. So I'm actually a little I don't think I'm two months, but I'm a little behind on the Brose podcast myself just because of the, you know, the chaos of my recent life. 
I don't need to go into any details on that. Doesn't matter. Yeah, it's none of your business, guys. But Gene is uh, burning the candle at both ends right now. Uh, again, I just want to let people know. Of course, there's the little uh, thing that plays at the beginning of each of our episodes. But we want to give a shout out in the body of the show to the Brose Podcast. It, it's it's a fun. Re- it's, it's a really chill. yeah. It's a great show. They're they're good guys. You feel like you're in the room with them, drinking and enjoying their chatter. It's it's a good show. That's the thing. Like I say all the time, like, oh, you know, I don't really go for a lot of these hangout shows where people are just hanging out on a podcast. But it's like, well, no, this is a good hang. Yeah. Like if you just want to hang with that's some bros. Thing. If you can make it compelling enough, it's it's a I, I really enjoy Brose. I really do. Me too. I'm glad that we're buddies because because we're pretty tight with these guys now. We're we're basically all sister brother wives with each other. Right. Right. That's fun. All right, my blushed story. I want to talk about a couple of mistakes you might be making when it comes time to do your makeup, particularly your blush. First and foremost, remember to choose a shade that's appropriate to your skin tone. If you got cool tones, you're gonna to want to you're gonna to want to avoid a warm shade because that's gonna make you look like a cupie doll. And if you got warm tones, you're gonna to want to you're gonna to want to avoid a cool tone because you're gonna look washed out. Also, I can't stress this enough: invest in good brushes. It makes all the difference. Hit up the apples of your cheeks in an upward motion. Remember to blend and keep in mind that a little bit goes a long way. Now, Gene, I have uh, what is referred to as an olive complexion. Mm -hmm. I have a a sort of a green undertone or a yellowish kind of undertone to my skin. I knew it. You're a fucking reptilian. Yes, uh, I am Jeff Bezos. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, but uh, <laughs> right wouldn't that be a twist turns out i was jeff bezos the whole time yeah um but uh what is the right blush for me because anytime i've tried to do anything that was like a warm color i look sick i look like i'm having some kind of vascular problem if you've got an olive colored skin i think mm-hmm. that honestly and this is appropriate given we just talked about brose i think a, a rose color would probably be the best blush to use okay now what's interesting is my my sort of natural color like when when color goes into my cheeks Mm -hmm. i feel like i look like like an absolute maniac um i i feel most like how i feel like i should look when i'm very pallid Mm -hmm. because even my even my pallor is kind of tawny you know and that's a good look yeah i think rose would be the way to go see the thing about rose is it falls kind of in the middle of the spectrum it's not it's not super warm like your reds and it's not super cool Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think i think it's definitely it it's the way i would go with with your skin tone okay i will definitely give that a try if i ever go outside again okay awesome let's move on to flushed all right well as my boy Gene over here struggles with the heartbreak of chronic sinus problems, mm-hmm. uh, I do want to remind anyone who uses a neti pot to only ever use distilled water. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that climate change is increasing the prevalence of waterborne pathogens, which not even your municipal water treatment system can eradicate. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you pour an amoeba into your brain, it is not a good time. Yeah. You will die. It's basically a 100% chance of death. Yes. You will absolutely die. And it's not like a cool death. No. You're not. And you're not the girl in love story. And foul Larry is the uh, brain eating amoeba. Really dangerous stuff. Yes. You do not want to get the negleria in your brain. Um, It will eat your brain straight up. Mm hmm. And it, it will so, it will hurt the whole time it's doing it too. Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, well, I'm trying to think of uh, another thing that eats your brain, but I mean, you don't really need an analogy to understand this. It eats your brain. No, yeah, it's don't, terrible. Don't put it in your don't put it in your brain. As an alternative, you can you can use tap water and stuff in in a neti pot. Just make sure that you boil the water for sixty seconds and get it to a true rolling boil and then let it cool and and you can use it. But uh, definitely don't take chances. Be safe. And and don't pour the boiling water into your nose. Well, right. Definitely not. But chlorine is not going to kill this thing. You do need to boil the water to make sure the water is safe. So, you know, distilled water, you can buy it at the store. And Mm -hmm. no, not all bottled water is distilled water. That's true. Don't pour 
go to the pharmacy and ask them where the distilled water is. Right. They'll show you. I would I would go to the pharmacy to ask specifically anyway because not all uh, water that's labeled distilled is actually distilled. Right. And so they're going to know true. the good stuff. Um, my story for Flushed is actually kind of related in a way. It's late to be advising it now, but this is a reminder that owners of spaces that haven't been occupied during the pandemic should have kept the water running in the absence of people. Whether flushing toilets once a week or letting faucets run for a time, keeping the water moving helps against the buildup of dangerous pathogens. Among them, Legionnaire's disease. So as things open up, probably best not to drink any public water. Definitely don't drink any stagnant water. Yeah, never drink stagnant water. Yeah. Even if even if you're just drinking water out of a glass, swish it around a little bit first, get it moving, <laughs> then drink it down. All right. All right. As you know, every week our investigative team uncovers a detailed and harrowing story on food crime. And this week, Greg Person has the story. After 32 weeks... I don't know why I haven't talked about it before. Actually, fun bit of person-in-person -person trivia. This was going to be the very first food crime on the first episode. And then a more immediate food crime happened as I was writing the notes for the first episode. And I pushed this off. And I never went back to it because there's always so much food crime in the world. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk to you about Soylent. Because Soylent is not like other food crimes. Most food crimes are failures or bad ideas or sometimes even half good ideas poorly executed. Mm -hmm. Soylent is a crime against the very idea of food. It is an outright blasphemy against life itself. It was invented by a software engineer who thought eating was inefficient because his spirit has been so stunted that he is utterly blind to the value, the point of his own existence. And it's a meal replacement muck, uh, if you haven't heard of it, that is gray and uh, has the flavor of Play-Doh with the consistency of pancake batter. Yeah, sounds... Sounds great. Sounds great. Right? Now, listen, folks. There is a reason that no culture on earth has replaced their native cuisine with flavorless gray nutrient muck. Mm -hmm. And it's not because they weren't smart enough. Okay. So if you're a tech brain out there, I want you to turn away from efficiency, optimization, tweaks, hacks, and overclocking your meatware. <laughs> Stop it. You are not a genius you've internalized the death drive of capitalism because efficiency is for machines and your boss wants to turn you into a machine, but that's wrong. You are a human being and the way that you experience the world actually does matter. So please choose life, choose food, and just don't eat Soylent, I beg of you. For literally, for the sake of your soul, don't eat Soylent. Also, it's full of lead and cadmium and rat shit. And people! Oh god, you wish there was people. Then there would be actual ingredients. Right. All right, it's on to the podcast shopping network. So, I've covered a lot of products on the podcast shopping network. Some of them more outrageous than others. Some of them downright terrifying. I'm looking at you, Rejuvenique Face Mask. But this is the very first product in the history of the segment that I honestly feel I cannot do justice just by talking about it. So I'm definitely going to post a link to the infomercial in the show notes just so that you can all experience the artistry that was flow. In the early 90s, in the home exercise market, well, it had become a bit of a lawless hellscape. By that time, the market was cornered by two fierce warlords. Too big to let anyone else play, let alone dream of a home exercise routine that wasn't manic hairy fun. I'm speaking, of course, of sweating to the oldies or hyper serious strength training on focused muscle groups. And Soloflex held the top position here. There just wasn't room for self expression in your exercise. But one little plastic bag changed all of that. Yeah, that's right, you heard me. Flow was a plastic bag filled with water, a very long, plastic bag filled with water. Sounds like a cheap piece of crap, right? 
I'd argue that what Flo gave us was priceless. Workouts with Flo weren't the drudgery we were all used to seeing up to that point. They were perpetual, engaging, timeless dances between a person and a plastic bag. Choreographed to music, sure, especially if it was heavy on the saxophone. But it was more than that. Those twisting motions touched the spirit, and on some level, I truly believe it was a workout choreographed to all that is beautiful, all that is peaceful, and all that is good in the world. At the same time as you were getting fit and setting the world of dance on fire, you were training heavily for an an inevitable battle with a snake. Maybe the snake is self-image. Maybe it's the judgment of society. I like to think that it's capitalism. I'm not sure what happened to Flo. All a Google search got me was a bunch of progressive commercials. But I do know it's a commercial failure was the killing blow to all hope we had as a species. In the waning years of the human race, at least for the t- for a time, we'll have the infomercial to watch and celebrate as we contemplate what might have been if the world wasn't what the world is, and if Flo had only lived. Wow. Powerful stuff. This... Okay, folks, I'm, I'm watching the infomercial right now of people using the flow. <laughs> I, I can see why it didn't catch on. You would not do this in public. You would not do it in front of a mirror. But it is weirdly beautiful. Right? It's, it's kind of like watching someone do Tai Chi with a baby wrapped up in a plastic bag. Right. It's, um... No, this... The longer I watch it, the more I like it. It's... These people are having more fun than I've ever had doing anything. Right? And it's mesmerizing. It is. Like, I'm not sure about how much of a workout this is, but I would... If you set this to music, um... You could show this on the, you know, stage of the Metropolitan Ballet. Yeah. And if you this, if you look at some really... of their faces, they are in this incredibly peaceful place. Oh, they they've been transported. Their their bodies are finally moving in harmony with their spirits. Right. I feel like that's what the flow is allowing you to do. Like Oh, see, and now here's one kind of putting a little bit of a hip hop twist. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. I get it. Yeah. So this is it. (laughs) You know, normally I I make fun of these products. I shit on them. Is this product ridiculous? Yes. Oh, it definitely is ridiculous. But but if you can break through that mental barrier, if you can say, you know what? I don't care if I look ridiculous. You're going to find a level of contentment that you've never known in your life. And that's what we thing. missed out on when flow failed. That's, that's all I have to say on the matter. I feel like it, give Jackie Chan one of these things. Oh my God. Or I can't even imagine Jet Lee or Donnie Wen. I mean, you could, you know, it's, it's beautiful. Like they're flipping, they're spinning. Mm-hmm. These are people that you look at them and you're like, that guy's not a spinner. He's not going to do a pirouette. And then he does a pirouette. Right. And you're the bag made him do that. Right. The bag freed the dancer that was inside him all the time. Okay. I got to stop watching. Because, <laughs> like, right. This is, I literally. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is the, why the I flow. said that you can't just, you can't just, I can't, you can't just listen to my description. You have to see it to understand. Yeah. You know, Give this give this a chance. Watch the infomercial and you'll be like, oh, I get it. Yeah. This is it's like watching your inner child right. play. <laughs> exactly. All right, let's and oh good. It's you know, it's like you're the bitter, cynical adult that you've become. It's like seeing your inner child at play and realizing like, I used to love myself. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh That's it for Podcast Shopping Network. Let's move on to State Up. This week, the state of Kentucky. 
The thing about Kentucky is that you can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. I've seen uh, photos of Kentucky, and the grass is fucking green. Bluegrass state my ass. In Kentucky, all turtles are protected species, because any one of those little bastards could be Mitch McConnell. It's true. Kentucky is home to the infamous Hatfields and McCoys, who I believe were members of the bands Metallica and 90s Euro dance group The Real McCoy. Everyone in Kentucky knows all the words to Tub Thumping by Chumbawamba. Nobody remembers how they all learned it or why. Kentucky's postal abbreviation is one of the only state abbreviations suitable for a joke about anal sex. Our final segment tonight, as every week, is Person to Person in Person, where we share your valuable feedback with our audience. Um, We do have some new feedback. Okay, so this is the email uh, we got from Richie, who is one of our original Tims, one of our best Tims. And and a co-host of Rosé. Indeed. One of the best podcasts. I absolutely agree with you about the end of Kim's Convenience. The show had legs and ended in such a point that it really should have continued at least one more season. I was surprised they didn't focus more on Uma in season five. I felt what they did with Jung's relationship was forced and garbage, true, and really want to see the main cast grow, especially what was going on with Janet. I was bummed we didn't get an actual finale, but just a season finale. I would love to know some of your favorite wholesome sitcoms. Does Parks and Rec count? Because that's mine. I would love a sitcom-based haiku. Love the show. Hate the puns. Keep up the good work. Okay, a little bit to unpack here. I think that Parks and Rec absolutely does count because it's Michael Schur. Um, in terms of favorite wholesome sitcoms, let's let's run like a quick top three. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you want to do yours first? Yeah, so I'm going to say that my very top one will always be The Good Place, but I'm not going to list that in my top three. Because that's obvious. We've talked about it at length on this show. Right. Same for me. We, You know we love The Good Place. We did literally like an hour and a half about it. Right. So I'm going to say uh, probably for the number three spot, I'm actually going to put Gilmore Girls on there. Ooh, good pick. Yeah. The, I, I love the rapid fire dial, dialogue. I think Amy Sherman Palladino is amazing. And uh, yeah, so that that would be my, my top Three, my number three choice. Um, I would say, oh, we're going, we're going in order from from least to best. Yeah. Okay. Wholesome sitcom. Okay. Uh, number three is Little Mosque on the Prairie. I mm. love this show. Um, it is, it's a show that follows that format of big city professional moves to small town full of oddballs. That's that's a fun formula. Except it's. The, the sort of stated goal of this show by the producer is to, in addition to making a sweet, wholesome comedy, to teach Canadians about Muslims, which, hmm. you know, I don't want to go into recent Canadian news, but I would say mixed results on that. Hmm. Uh, Canadians not so chill as you would guess from their television shows. But this show is very sweet. The reason it's my number three is because I love it. I love all the characters. It makes me feel happy and warm and fuzzy inside every time I watch it. But it's too gentle and earnest to actually be funny. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's because, you know, humor does require that edge and this show just won't do it. So it's it's sweet. You should watch it. You will enjoy it, but you will not laugh. I think my next pick might be a little controversial. Uh, I think for number two, I'm going to go with 30 Rock. Because even though it doesn't depict a family like some of these shows do, it, I think at its core, despite all the zaniness and some of the adult themes that are at play, it's still a very wholesome show. I think so. I'd agree with that. Um, and it's super funny. Because it's, the, the, it's not a the magic. Show. The magic mix of characters that they created for that and the way they they develop those characters over the seasons is just its own kind of magic. My only problem with 30 Rock, and I don't know how much feedback you're looking for on these picks, is that as the show went on, the, the comedy 
aspects of the characters had to keep getting dialed up and dialed up and dialed up. No, I, I absolutely can see that. That's a very valid critique, I think. Which is, I mean, the same thing happened with Community. It happens with all comedies. Because right. you have to do that. Right. Um, let's see, what would be my number two wholesome show that I love? Uh, no, number two is Speechless. I don't know if anyone ever saw Speechless. Um, I don't think I have. So it's got... Uh, Scott Mini Driver is kind of the biggest name in the cast. Uh, Cedric Yarbrough is in the cast. Uh, the main star of the show is, let me Google his name because I used to, Micah something, I used to follow him on Twitter. Micah Fowler, that was it. That took me a second to come up with. It's a story about uh, a kid who, he's, he's a teenager, he has uh, cerebral palsy, He's in a he's in a wheelchair and he's nonverbal. Even though Micah Fowler uh, is not nonverbal, he plays a nonverbal character, and it's a family show. You know, it's about, but it's it's genuinely funny. Um, but it also deals with issues of disability and inclusion and family and just being a teenager with a lot of extra baggage, um, in, in a very funny way that is also never mean never saccharin um it is a really really good show and i don't know how many people watched it there are three seasons um i would say check it out i think i'm gonna go with uh scrubs for my final pick fuck that's a good one bill lawrence super wholesome despite again you know running with a lot of really adult themes and stuff uh dealing with some really big issues in really creative and wonderful ways great show absolutely absolutely Uh, i'm gonna go with a recent show for my number one Mm -hmm. uh, superstore okay it's about the employees of a big box store Uh, it's got uh america ferrera um oh i love her i loved ugly betty oh god ugly betty was great Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's you know that's the first thing that I ever saw her in. She's she's so good in this. Um, there's a bunch of other actors that you might know. Uh, Colton Dunn is in it. Um, Mark McKinney is in it. Oh, great! Uh, he's hysterical. And it's it's a show about you know these guys that work in a sort of a Walmart esque store. Mm-hmm. And it's like the only workplace comedy that I think I've ever seen that really empathizes with the audience because it's like look work sucks and your employer sucks like these guys they have what are for me as kind of a a working class schmuck uh very relatable problems where it's like i need to go to the doctor but i don't have insurance oh you know Mm -hmm. i i need to find somebody to watch my kid because i can't afford daycare Oh, you know, and and I'm worried about getting deported, shit like that. It's really interesting to hear that because the main reason I even avoided watching Superstore was because I thought I would just glorify, you know, the eponymous store. It is literally the exact opposite of that. I have to check it out now. And it's the thing is, is like I'm making it sound like it's this heavy moralistic show. This show is bonkers as shit great and it's it's hilarious it's so good and i was worried at the at the end of the fifth season i was worried that the sixth season would be a bit of a downer because there were rumors of some cast shakeups that would be a big deal but it all came together in the end i would say from beginning to end all six seasons this show is damn near perfect wow so check out Superstore. So we had uh, we had planned on talking about the first of the two bonus episodes that we plan on recording soon in this segment, but we have run out of time. Do you have any topics you'd like us to write a haiku about? Don't worry, Richie. Your haiku are coming in next week's episode. Folks, that's all the show we have for you tonight. We love your feedback, and there's so many ways to give it to us. Send us an email, personandpersonshow at gmail.com. 
Tell us what you'd like us to write a haiku about, and we will. Find us on Twitter at Anchor Persons or check out our website, personandpersonshow.com. Until next time, this is Gene Person saying you should always end a comedy set with a callback. And this is Greg Person saying, Square Pigs. Good night. I get knocked down, but I get up again. They're never going to keep me down. I get knocked down, but I get up again. They're never going to keep me down. I get knocked down, but I get up again. They're never going to keep me down. Good night.